to ask a question um, via audio, make sure you've debugged your audio uh, settings ahead of time. So our speaker today is Joseph Khaled, who is a third year graduate student working with Alexei Drummond. Originally from Israel, Joseph lived in LA from 1990 to 1996, worked in the software industry. In his words, that was the fun part of the internet bubble. He then moved to New Zealand in 1996. Joseph has been interested in biology and bioinformatics since reading Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, in the mid 80s. After working for an American software company in New Zealand, he started a master's with Alexi, then worked with Biomatters for a while, then decided to go ahead and get a PhD. So now we're all very lucky to have him tell us about Starbeast and give us a little bit of a software demonstration. All right, Joseph, go ahead. Hey, welcome, everyone. And uh, we'll start on the way. So uh, in 1965, uh, Will Henning uh, published a paper called Phylogenetic Systematics. And in the opening paragraph, he says that the investigation of the phylogenetic relationships between all existing species and the expressions of the results of this research in form which cannot be misunderstood is a task of phylogenetic systematics. Now, the, uh, the urge to uh, to classify probably goes back a long way, maybe millions of years. But systematics, the systematic classifications of living or once living things uh, um, as a scientific endeavor goes uh, uh, back even before Darwin. So we have here um, two nice examples. One is from 1801. And which shows us a, a, a tree. I'm not sure exactly of what. And this is a, a, a one from 1840, uh, which shows both the animal and the, uh, the plant kingdom. Now, what I find nice about those uh, two examples, except for the fact that the, uh, it's nice to see trees with leaves and they are green and <laughs> they are the right way up, but uh, uh, for example, here in this chart, you can actually uh, see that on, on the left, there are the uh, 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 geological times. Uh, even though, uh, for example, uh, here in this example, I mean, he refers to God as driving all this change that he documented here. And so here we have in this tree, we have the, the, uh, the times, but as far as I can understand, those are... Uh, um, those classes that we see here, those are just the super classes. They are not really, they are really confused. They really don't know exactly what they are documenting here. And we had to wait until uh, Darwin that brought us phylogeny, which is the natural evolutionary relationship between groups of living things. And the point is that if you have a, a stamp collection or a book collection and you want to uh, classify it or, or, or uh, um, categorize it, you can do it in lots of many ways. You can start with the uh, with author or language or genre. Uh, every classification is, uh, is as valid as all the other ones. And, but with, with the living things, there is actually only one correct uh, uh, way to classify them because if we are now, everybody accept that uh, Darwin um, uh, theory that we all descended from, uh, from one common ancestor, then the right way to classify is by, uh, <coughs> by the, uh, this uh, evolutionary uh, relationship. So, and that's, that was so important that the only figure here, in, in, uh, as everybody knows, in Darwin's uh, book had this... Uh, kind of phylogeny, which uh, is very modern. I mean, we immediately recognize uh, what we see here. Now, the, uh, um, since we, we started um, uh, having um, uh, discovered genetics, so to speak, uh, we are uh, uh, also started investigating the genetics of those uh, populations. And, this is also goes back uh, uh, quite a while, and here we have 
uh, from 1988, uh, Hardy explaining about the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium. And again, this was before the, uh, the time that we actually discovered what, uh, what the DNA uh, was. But the moment that we discovered uh, the DNA and actually a way to read the, uh, the DNA, we immediately started uh, uh, building those kind of uh, phylogenies. And this is an example from 1967. Now, this is probably not the first one, but it's definitely one of the earliest ones. And this is already contains all the, uh, all the core elements of what we are doing up until today. We, have, we take one individual from the species that we're interested in, in and we take one gene uh, and we read this genetic information from this one gene, and then we take those uh, genetic uh, sequences or information, and since we are, again, we are assuming that they all descended from a, a common ancestor, we organize them in a tree which reflects this relationship in the sense that two sequences or two individuals that are further apart genetically, they are they are further away uh, in the tree and vice versa. So if this tree is what we call clock-like, that means it actually represents time in some way. So in this case, more distant, uh, 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 genetically more distant individuals, their common ancestor goes further back in time. So this is perfectly valid and uh, can work very well, but sometimes we, uh, we run into uh, problems. And I'm going to, uh, to show you what kind of problems we can run into uh, using an example uh, from a data set that uh, uh, will hopefully soon be published and I help uh, doing the analysis for. And this is a, a, from the genus uh, Apolocoma. These are birds, they are nice blue birds, and it's not really clear how many uh, species they are, uh, they are looking quite similar, as you can see, and they are spread uh, over the America, uh, Mexico, and, and maybe a little bit even more south. So there are, I think that there used to be uh, officially three species, but now people are debating whether uh, other groups should, uh, should be called species as well. And we'll uh, go back to that uh, point uh, in a minute. So I'm going to start by doing exactly the same thing that, uh, uh, that Fitch did. I mean, we take one individual, we take one gene, and I use BIST here to build a phylogenetic tree for that. And since uh, I know that everybody says that if I'm interested in the species, I need in BIST to select what's called a prior for this uh, tree. So what I'm going to select here, since this is a, a, I'm interested in species, I'm um, selected here a, a, a birth death, death um, prior. Now, as a biologist, I look at this tree and I'm extremely unhappy because it doesn't reflect anything that I know about those birds. And I'm pretty convinced that the, uh, here the FLSJ, which is the, uh, the, the one in Florida, he, he has to nest with, I mean, he has to probably be an outgroup of the other, uh, uh, of the other Js. And, I mean, this is the one that, that was uh, living here. So I know, I know that I expect him to be uh, somewhere else. Um, so what do I do? I sequence another gene, and I build a tree. And the same individuals, and I get a different tree. Both of those trees I'm not happy with. Okay, both of them do not reflect what I expect and what I know. And it's also troubling that I got, I mean, if those are the species, I got two different trees. I mean, so which is the right tree, right? So people tell me, okay, use all the data you have. So I concatenate both of those and build a third tree here, down here. And again, this is a tree that doesn't seem to reflect any biological uh, relationship that I expecting between those uh, species. 
In some parts, it's more similar to the uh, to one tree. In some parts, it's similar to the other tree. Still, it is not. Uh, it is uh, deeply unsatisfying. So, I go and take a different set of individuals, and same gene, and I build a tree, and again, I get a different tree. So, now I'm, uh, I'm saying I'll take lots of individuals and put all of them in a tree, and maybe I can understand what is going on. And then I put it into beast, and I build a tree, and I get something like that. Okay? Now, obviously nobody publishes uh, those kind of trees uh, because you can look at and see what, uh, what kind of mess it is. And one indication of, of seeing what kind of a mess it is is that you actually, if you look here, you can see that this is actually sort of a bug of a feature uh, in the way this tree was generated in that the times of some of those clades, which are supposedly uh, ancestral to the other clades, actually came out. Uh, younger, so you have those kind of strange behavior. So you can definitely see that something here is uh, is wrong. And if you look at the uh, estimates for the time of those, which is what we are interested in in this uh, in this paper, the time of the uh, speciation, this is even worse. Okay, so this is obviously completely hopeless, and uh, something is wrong. And what is wrong is, has been known for a very long time, a very long time. This is a good man for 1967, eh, 1979, sorry. And he was talking about uh, uh, gene duplication, but the principle is exactly the same. And let's see what uh, Goodman says here. We have a species history here, which is, C has diverged from the ancestor of A and B at some stage, and at a later stage, A and B diverged. And so this is our concept of a species tree, is the time and the order of the divergences of the species themselves. And on the second side here, we have one specific gene, and we are tracing back its history, its ancestry. And it can be different from the one that we had from the species. And here, Goodman explains the reason. The reason is that for this specific gene, the ancestor of all those three at some point in the ancestral species of both, of uh, three of them, of the three of them, they, he had two descendants. One of them became the descendant here of B, and the other one went, after, and after some time, became the descendant of A and C. So the point here is that all this action, so to speak, happened in the ancestral species, species of A, B, and C. And that's the reason why we got this kind of a, a mismatch between what the gene said and what the, uh, the, the species' actual history was. And this is the same. I mean, he explained it, as I said, he explained it here for gene duplication. And it is the same for a, a, a mutation. And to try and help us with this specific situation, uh, this is where Starbeast uh, uh, comes in. Now, the star here is actually an acronym, even though we had such a uh, hard time finding a, a name for this new software that we are sort of like still trying to hide it. And, but there is an actual acronym here for Species Tree Ancestral Reconstruction. And this is what we are going to, uh, uh, the model of service, that's what I'm going to discuss uh, today. So first I would like to, uh, to talk about how we represent those species trees graphically. So here is a, a one example, and you already familiar with the, uh, with the notion that we have time on the y-axis and not on the x-axis from a gene freeze. Well, usually in most graphs, uh, time is on the x-axis. 
So we have time on the, on the y-axis, and it goes from zero, which is now, today, back in, into the future, into the past. So this is where we are used to. But what we have here on the uh, x-axis has to do with the population. So it represents the population. It's, it's not only represents the population, the width of, uh, of this uh, channel here represents the size. So larger populations, they'll be wider, and it's proportional to, uh, to the widths here. Um, so what I would like to uh, um, just say a few words is about the units, because this is something that's always, I'm getting confused every time I have to do it uh, uh, again, and I've seen uh, even smarter people than me uh, getting confused. So we'll just cover it once, and, and this will be helpful maybe in other situations as well. And so we have the graph, and we have time, which we measure in some units one. I mean, sometimes we try to scale it so it will mean millions of years or something, but it's not always possible. And we have here the population here, uh, the unit of one. So what do those one and one mean? So we take them to mean that if this one stood for n individuals, whatever, a million individuals, then the one here in the time is n generations or million generations. Now, the reason why we are like to work in generations is that we don't always want to commit or know the, gen the exact generation time. So as long as we're saying this is in generations, we are, we are happy. It's, uh, um, so we have here n individuals and n generations. And here is for an example, since we are usually getting our times, uh, what we call in substitutions, because we are getting them from our model that models the, uh, the genetic uh, uh, mutations. So if our time here is one substitution, right? And I'm assuming here, for example, uh, 0.01 substitution per million years which means one substitution for 100 million years. And if my generation time is 10 years, it means that my one here of the population is 10 million. So this is a way for us that we can go back from our results, from, from any kind of a, a analysis, but if we know the, uh, to convert back the substitution back to time, and we know the generation time, we can actually tell what those numbers uh, in the population uh, mean, but that's not always, I mean, it's not always possible, but if we can commit to generation time and the substitution time, then we can uh, convert back. Okay, so this is the, uh, the main uh, idea here, which you already saw, and we're going to, uh, to repeat, is that we are what we call embedding the gene trees inside the species tree. I drawn the species tree as I explained, and now we can put those uh, traditional gene trees inside. And the rule is I cannot cross those lines. Those lines represent uh, those boundaries to gene flow. And this is a point that I'm, I've been talking about species, everybody's talking about species, but those are not necessarily species in the, uh, like as a, as a taxonomic group. Those are any group that is separated from the other groups and there is no gene flow. And the model is strict here. I mean, the moment uh, that this uh, divergence started, we're assuming there is no connection between uh, uh, those two groups. And this is a strong assumption, but the, all the, uh, the models that we currently have uh, we're assuming a uh, strict uh, divergence. So you can see here in this small, this is a, an example from a simulated, uh, data, simulated data, you can see here um, all those situations that we talked about. For example, here, this lineage here, we see that it is more closely related to uh, individuals from this species than to its own uh, members, etc. So we can see all those kind of uh, problems that if we were taking here, 
the same thing, the gene tree as a proxy from the species tree, we would get the wrong tree. Now, those kind of... Uh, um, I just wanted to, this is something uh, really interesting. Like I said, we're usually talking about, we're thinking about the separation for those species as those two individuals from those species cannot uh, mate and have uh, in viable offsprings. But sometimes even maybe they are living too far, maybe it's geographical, maybe they are living far away. I mean, if you bring them together, they will. Uh, they will be able to have viable offsprings, and uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, they do live together. But uh, uh, I don't know. The female does, does, do not like the smells of the other ones of the other uh, males. I mean, this is uh, perfectly um, uh, possible, and sort of like the the, uh, the start of the speciation happen can happen in all, all those kind of ways, and there was. Um, so, um, something that I read on the web about um, about birds, about the black caps, which were uh, overwintering in, in Spain and returning to Central Europe. And then a group of them started uh, doing that in England because some people are actually providing food for them. And actually, the researcher, after maybe 20 or, or 25 years, actually found genetic differences between those two groups. They were sort of like give them another, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of years, they will spe speciate. Because, and apparently the reason was that the, uh, the words that were overwintering in England uh, returned uh, sooner back. So they were mating with, the, with other birds that came sooner. So all those kind of things can, uh, can happen. And, and so we have to remember that we are talking here not about necessarily species as we understand them, but any group that is actually uh, separate from the other groups. And if you have data, you should, for example, try to, uh, to put them, if you collected them from different geographical areas, you should put each one of them probably as its own species first and see what happens. And even though you, uh, if you suspect they are, maybe they are some, this is what other people call subspecies, uh, population structure, whatever. So any kind of those uh, separate groups, they should be represented as a separate species when you're trying to analyze, at least as a start, and see uh, what the data says. Now, as far as the model, how we model those, um, um, the gene trees, we have here, this is a concept from population genetics, which is the, uh, the right Fisher uh, model. And the idea is that we have sort of like an ideal number of, popula uh, um, of individuals, and they are what's called perfectly mixing. In that, th those lines here represent generations, and in each generation, each individual is randomly the uh, descendant of one other individual. So we can see some individuals do not have ancest uh, descendants at all, but everyone has an ancestor. And when we are actually uh, building our uh, gene trees, we're sort of like, tracing this line back uh, to the past. And what happens when we actually have those species boundaries is that, as we can see here, those two stop mixing. And we have those, uh, uh, each one of those groups continuing uh, on its own. And there is, the, uh, the mathematical theory, which everybody, I hope, uh, here at least heard about, which is called the, uh, the Kingman Coalescent. And in our model, we assume that in every branch of the species tree, or in every uh, species or ancestral species, inside this branch, we are still uh, following the, uh, um, the, the classic Kingman Coalescent. Okay? And maybe uh, sort of like informally, if we have here a large population like we have here on the gorilla, it takes longer until uh, any one of those lineages uh, coalesce or reach their common ancestors. So we see here, we had here uh, one, two, 
three lineages survived here in, up to this stage, but we can see here this species had smaller population size, and all of them, there was only one lineage left. It means that the, the, uh, the common um, ancestor of all of them still lived in the time of this uh, species. So maybe I should uh, point out here something about the, uh, the model that is slightly different from other models, is that we are here assuming that the population uh, size, first of all, is continuous in the sense that we're assuming that the size of the ancestral population at some time split into two. And from that point on, they both uh, continued. And if the population size can change over time. I mean, it is uh, most models that we have today, including BEST, etc. they're assuming that the population size is constant over the species' uh, lifetime. And here we allow at least a starting and an ending point. So the population can shrink or, 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 uh, or grow as uh, time goes by. So that's why we're getting those, uh, this, those nice figures. And so as this, uh, um, as you can see here, we are using multiple uh, individuals from each one of those uh, species. Now, this is uh, really important because if we had only one individual from each one of those species, then we will not actually be able to estimate the population sizes, definitely not for the uh, extant uh, species here. So we need at least two and preferably more. And this is something that most data sets today, they are starting to, to, to have multiple individuals per species, but still a lot of the uh, data sets, they have only one individual per species, and that's for the estimation process, that's really not good. It can introduce a lot of uh, bias and a lot of nasty stuff that, uh, that you don't want. So we are, uh, we are really encouraging multiple uh, individuals per species, but this is all not always enough because, like we said, sometimes if you go up in the tree, you will see that there's not enough lineages left for determining what happened in the upper regions. And that is where the more important uh, feature comes in and that we want to have multiple genes, multiple loci from each individual. And this is really, this is really confusing, but the idea is that here each one of those uh, colors represents a different gene. And we have multiple individuals here from each one of those species. Now, there is a reason why this is uh, really important, and that the way we are actually uh, being able to estimate what time this divergence happened between here, between uh, the human and the chimp, say, is that we look at the last time that they had, we had a common ancestor. In this case here, it's the red here, okay? So if I had only the blue gene, the time that I would have is here, much further in the past. So if we are looking at this divergence time, if I have several genes, I can look and see which one says is the, uh, the most recent one. And this is the one that is sort of like blocking me, making, uh, Making me not making it not possible to have this divergence time go up, okay? But the red one is not the best one for this divergence time. For this divergence time, actually, the blue one is better. So you can see that if we have several of those genes or several of those opinions, each one of them can help us in a different area of the tree. So that's why having multiple uh, multiple genes or multiple loci is the most important factor on how good you can get um, uh, in estimating uh, those trees. <clears throat> so Starbis uh, uh, does the, the uh, uh, co-estimates everything. It means that we estimate in one go both the species tree, the gene trees, the population size, and all the other parameters. And it can take any number of 
uh, individuals and any number of genes. I mean, the, you don't have to have all the genes from all the individuals, etc. You, the only restriction here is that you need at least uh, one one individual in each in each species, in each one of those genes. But you can actually fake it, but we won't go into that here. And the nice thing about implementing it as part, uh, as part of uh, this is that we can use to model the gene trees all the vast machinery that we have actually in BIST. And we have, uh, we have relaxed clocks, we, we have a lot of uh, good stuff that we already know how to model those gene trees. So we can use all of that and, uh, and not only that, we can use any kind of a future uh, method. If somebody tomorrow have a different model um, that estimates gene trees, we can use it together with Starbeast. So this is sort of like sits on top of the regular machinery for estimating the gene trees uh, inside BIST. Now, Starbeast, like BIST, is a Bayesian model. That means that we uh, we define the probability for every combination of uh, gene trees and the species and the population sizes, and we compute this kind of probability, and we sample from what we call from this space, from this uh, 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 probabilistic space. And this might look a little bit intimidating, but it's not that bad. So let's just have a quick look at that. Uh, so what we have here is we have here for all the gene trees that we, ha we, are, we, we, we are having. So this integral here means this is for all the gene trees that, that we have. We're taking here, we multiply this, uh, uh, this quantity, which contains, first of all, what we call the Felstein likelihood, is the probability of the data given our gene tree. So this is our uh, regular uh, likelihood that we compute when we are doing just the gene tree. And we multiply this by what we call the multi-species coalescent, which is how uh, likely this gene tree is given the species tree. So we have n of those. If we have n genes, we have n of those. And finally, we uh, multiply this by what we call the prior on the species tree. And that is how likely, we have some kind of a model saying, how likely is this species tree to start with? And we usually use a birth, a, like a Yule model or a birth death model for that. And again, this is nothing new. I mean, here in 97, Madison uh, gave, it's slightly different. I mean, he has here a, a sum instead of the, uh, of the integral because he was probably doing parsimony. Uh, I'm guessing, and he was doing maximum likelihood, but the formula, in essence, is the same. It's the same, uh, exactly the same idea. Now, there are loads and lots of other uh, uh, programs and uh, methods to estimate the species tree. And here I just listed the, a few of them, and now that I did the search for um, I found they're still being published today, uh, more and more methods. And the reason is estimating this, uh, this integral here that we saw is actually quite hard. It's quite hard to, to do. And the reason is why we, are, uh, why we are bordering. So I'm going to show you, first of all, a quick overview of how those methods are actually um, different from Starbeast, and then we discuss why we are bothering to do this at all. So, so what we have here, this is in the center, this is the likelihood, as we showed, this was, would be the full likelihood that we are trying to evaluate. And this is what other uh, methods are, are trying to do, and it, by eliminating some parts of this complex uh, complicated uh, expression. For example, if we drop here this uh, multiplication, all those, so we say we don't have multiple gene trees, and we drop all this part, so this, this is the same as 
concatenating all the sequences and using the gene tree instead of the species, for example. Okay? Here, down here, we have here, I mean, don't do the integral, do maximum likelihood instead. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, this part here, uh, down here, it means don't co-estimate the gene trees. Get them magically from somewhere by estimating them uh, 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 somewhere else and then have a method that, given those gene trees, do something else, uh, minimize uh, deep coalescences, whatever. I mean, those are the kind of, uh, there are loads of lots of ways to do that, but the main idea here is that you don't co-estimate the gene trees, you assume that they are known and fixed. Um, so, and, and this is something that, at least in the setting that we are talking about, is, uh, I mean, everybody is doing it, but it's really bad, and I want to show you here something that's, hmm. yeah, from a, a wonderful tool, uh, somebody here in this group, in the group, Remco, wrote, and, and, and this tool allows us to see all the trees that come out from a, 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 a beast or star beast analysis. Okay, so you can see the uncertainty here in the, uh, uh, visually, which is something that we didn't have before, and it's it's a really great tool. And here we can see one such tree, such gene tree from from inside the star beast analysis. But this is sort of like to show you that all the other methods that actually go and pick one one specific tree out of out of here. So your result will really depend on which one you picked, and it's getting much, much worse. I mean, this is a good tree. I mean, here is another one. This, the other one was from mitochondrial data. This is from nuclear data. This is on the log scale, but still. I mean, picking just one tree here is really problematic. It's really problematic, and the results will vary greatly depending on what you pick. So that's why, in, at least in those kinds of scenarios, we really need a Bayesian method that will go over, sort of like integrate uh, over all those trees, take all those possibilities into account and return to us something that tells us how uncertain we are of the results. I mean, if this is really bad, then we should get a result that says, I don't really know exactly where the, uh, where the tree is. And if we, have, if we have a better tree, like here, then we can get a better, uh, a better result. <coughs> okay. So now I'm going to talk um, about uh, computing the multi-species coalescent, which is part of uh, Starbase, and this is actually one of the easiest part. Everybody, I mean, all the uh, there's a lot of packages doing it, and it's very easy because we can do it just what we call recursively. I mean, because we can do it for the ancestral tree by knowing just how many lineages has arrived here to the divergence time, and we can do the subtree by repeating the same procedure. So to do the whole tree, we do the ancestral branch, and then we do the left side and the right side, and we combine them just by adding up the log likelihoods. So this is actually very easy if you're not a mathematician and you don't really know about this. I mean, that's not really important, but this is the uh, this is actually the, uh, the easy part. Now, what I want to, uh, um, to talk a little bit about more is that the, the part that is actually specific to star beast. And that is most of the things that I'm using in star beast, they are, were already in, 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 in beast, and they are sort of like standard. This is sort of like uh, something that helps us actually uh, get uh, established going. And that is the way we are actually making changes into the species trees in order, species tree in order to get it uh, to uh, what we call the, the chain to mix. In the MCMC, we are constantly changing everything, including the species tree and the population sizes. We have to change it in order to reach the, uh, all the space. 
And this is the way we are uh, doing the species trees. And again, this is something that Mao, uh, this is from 99. And it's based on the idea that we have a special way of representing this tree. And that is we actually take the tree and we take the leaf, we put them here in line, and we represent the tree by those kind of bars that represent the height of this node. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the basic idea, and here we have like this is the simplest tree that we can have. We have A, B, and C here, and the idea is that there actually can be different ways to write this tree. Right? Those are all the same tree. What I did, I just flipped here, from here to here, I just flipped the left and the right, I flipped, sorry, the left and the right side here. And here I flipped the left and the right side, the A and the BC, and here I flipped both of them. So what we do, we start with taking the tree and at each one of those nodes, we arbitrarily decide if we want to keep it that way or switch it. So eventually, we, we, we can get different types of ordering here of those leaves. It's the same tree, but we get different types of ordering here. And then, and then like we showed, we have here a bar that represents the, uh, the height here between the A and the rest of the tree, OK? Or in this case, we have A here and separated by a, a B and C. So the idea is that now that we have this kind of representation, what we can do is that we actually go and change the height of one of those bars. So here I have an example where I took the, uh, the height here, which represented the root, and I brought it down. OK? And now I got this new tree. And the point is that if you see, if you look, this is actually a tree which has a different topology or a different ordering. Previously, A was here. We had here a clade of B and C and A. And here we have A and B together and then C. And again, it's very easy to, uh, to get from here to the tree. What we do is we pick up the highest one. This would be the root. And then we connect it to the next one. So this is how I got this tree. I picked this as a root, and I had one bunch going here to C, and then one bunch going here to the root of A and B. So why is that really uh, uh, nice for us? The reason is, if we look here at, a, uh, at this tree, and let's say what I want to do is move uh, this node, I want to move. So I can move it up like that. I can move it up, and I'm getting this tree, OK, where C has moved in uh, closer to the root. And I can move it even further up. And I can get this node to be actually the root. The, the reason why this is, uh, uh, this is nice is that if we look here, I mean, how much, how much can we push this node up in our case? We can push it up until as long as we don't have a common ancestor of B and C that is blocking it. Because the moment I pushed it above the common ancestor of B and C, then I violated the, uh, the condition that I said that the gene trees are not allowed to cross those, bound, those boundaries. So as long as I was able to, to not encounter any one of those ancestors, then I'm fine. And here, I can push this even further as long as I'm not really encountering any ancestors between C and A and B, OK? Between C and A and B. And again, here, I can push this even further as long as I don't encounter any ancestors between A or B. and a, A, B, and C, D, E. So 
this is really great because what happens is that if I want, for example, to move this node, all I need to do is look at the gene freeze and see where is the minimal, the, the, uh, the most recent common ancestor between any one of those pairs, between A and C, B and C, D and B, between all of those pairs, and this gives me an upper bound. So I can move it anywhere I want here and, by, and still not violate the gene, tree, the gene trees, okay? So that's really uh, great because this is where uh, uh, those methods are having a problem. We need to change it in a, in a, to, to bring it from one valid state to the other. And this is what enables us to, uh, to do it. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, generating some, uh, some simulated data and then talking about the results. And um, how are we doing for time, Eric? Uh, we're doing well. Yeah, I mean, okay. if you could wrap up in the next uh, five or ten minutes, that'd be nice. I mean, okay. I, I think you want to give a, a demo as well, right? So Yeah. So maybe I'll, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll give the demo right after I talk about this, and then we'll do whatever we, uh, we can after. Okay. So in order to, uh, to test the method and uh, also compare it to other methods, um, so what we do is we generate a species tree here. And we then generate multiple gene trees, and I generate sequences for them. And then we throw them into StarBeast, and we look how close did we get for, um, uh, to the original tree, OK? And what we get is something um, like this. This is the graph that shows us when we're starting adding more and more genes, more and more loss sites what we are getting here. So here in this graph, we see the size of what we call the credible interval, how many trees were in the 95% credible intervals. So we can see here, with, if, we, if we can manage 32 loci, we are, uh, um, we are down to uh, almost two trees. And here we have the error. Think of this error as sort of like in, in percent of the, uh, of the divergence time. So this is uh, a measure on the whole tree. This is, uh, I'm not, uh, I mean, the, uh, it's called the rooted branch score. It's sort of like a sum of all the errors or, or divergence times of all the tree, okay? So you can see that this is also going down uh, uh, really well. So here from about 30% uh, to about and, and to about close to 5%. And, okay, so we'll have to, uh, have to skip those. Okay, so here is another uh, uh, reminder why computation is, is really, really bad. Because if you take the data from one of those data sets and you confederate all of them together and you build a tree here, you get a tree which is extremely, extremely, looks extremely, extremely good. I mean, all the, uh, the posterior nodes here are almost 100%. So it's a very, very well-resolved tree. But it's totally wrong in the sense that if you picked up any individual here and, and you did uh, just one individual and you build the tree, you will get a different tree from the original species tree. And as you see, the divergence times are really way off because the, uh, the, gene, the gene times are way, um, are way more ancient than the times of the species trees. Okay? And, okay, so let us uh, go and, and do the demonstration, just a second. Should we take a couple questions while, while you're sure. getting that set up? Sure. Anybody have any questions? Just go ahead and type in there. I mean, I, I do, but I don't want to dominate the question. Asking too much. <laughs> but go ahead and, and give us a demo. That's looking okay. good. Okay, see. okay, so this is a uh, beauty. So the first thing you do in beauty is we have to, um, to import uh, 
our data files. So I have here uh, the data file, which is uh, three, uh, three genes. And if I'm doing the star base, so the first thing, which is not obvious, I'm going here to the trace. And I'm doing add trait. And luckily, the first thing is already defined. It says trait is a species. And I press OK. And I get here all the taxa. Now, the idea is that I should name the taxa in a way that it's easy to see what the species name is. And I'm pressing here, guess the, uh, the taxa name. And the taxa name is the prefix, is whatever comes before the first underscore. So I press OK here, and I can see each one of those taxa, I've assigned them to species. So those are individuals, and each one of them now is assigned to a species. So duty automatically, when I did that, actually, he assigned, he separated those models. He assigned to each one of those genes, he assigned the separate uh, substitution model, clock model, and a tree, OK? Which is uh, because when I started, when, when I lo loaded them together, he thought that they were part of the same uh, data set. So now what I want to go to do is go here and first of all define what, I w uh, what kind of analysis I want to each one of those. So for example, here on the, uh, um, on the mitochondrial DNA, I have more data so I can do a more, uh, I can do a GTR and I can split them into a codon positions, for example, and here I'll with those nuclear ones, I'll, I'll leave them as, as they are. Now, this is another important point. I'm going here to the clock models. And in Starbeast, you have to have one of them which is as a reference. So in this case, I choose the mitochondrial one to be my reference. And I'm going to estimate the rates of the, uh, of the other nuclear genes. So actually, for... Um, And so I'm actually going to to have, say, something more elaborate here for the mitochondrial DNA. I can have a relaxed clock here. Okay, so I can play whatever I want with the uh, with the specific gene trees here. And as long as I need I need one of them probably to uh, to estimate. Or another option if I if I have more information here on the uh, mitochondrial DNA, I can actually estimate it. I'll show you this in, in a second. And now I'm going here to the trees, and this is also something important. So I have to actually tell Starbeast that this is actually a mitochondrial tree, and those are nuclear. Because otherwise, I will get a, uh, my analysis will be wrong because the, uh, the population sizes of the mitochondrial and nuclear genes are, are different. And here I can actually choose something about how I'm do, going to do the star uh, analysis. So I can here select a prior here, either you or a death, birth death process. And, and my suggestion to you is always to use you because you can never estimate the death uh, parameter. Not in our data, not in the data sets that we have. So it's really just a, a nuisance. So you can use the Yule process, that's fine. And here we have actually three different uh, options on how to model the population sizes. The continuance is the one that I showed you in my example. We have here another option, which is the default is continuous and the constant root, which means population size changes up until the root, but the root is a constant. And we have a third option, which is each branch is constant population size. So you use this constant uh, one when we have very few, uh, we don't have a lot of data, and we can't really estimate uh, uh, those population sizes well. So it's a, it's a matter of if you have enough data, then uh, go for the continuous. Otherwise, you can, you can go for uh, continuous and constant root, and then to the constant uh, case. And usually you don't want to touch the, uh, uh, the priors unless you know what you're doing. And like I said, for example, if I know 
actual, the actual rate of the mitochondrial DNA, and I want to get my times, not the substitutions, but in something else, I can actually say, estimate this parameter, and I can go here to the, uh, to the priors and, and actually, you know, and here, and I will have to change the, uh, since I choose the uh, uncorrelated clock, I will need to, to go and choose something so I can choose the normal, say, a mean of 0.01. Point oh, so I have something. This is a 0 0.01 per million years. So this will come out. My my uh, mitochondria will come out in a million years. So my whole analysis will be uh, my time scale will be in a million years this way. So there's a lot of power here, but uh, you need to know uh, what you're doing. Anything more than that, it's possible to have some kind of uh, priors on specific nodes, etc. But Beauty doesn't support it. You have to do it manually. And that's sort of like I'm, I'm planning to put some example files uh, soon, so you'll see what you're doing, but I'm not sure when you have support for that in Beauty. So that's all there is to it. And then you go here to the MCMC and you uh, generate the file. So again, you load your files, you define the, uh, the species here in the traits, and then you play around whatever you want to, uh, to analyze your gene trees and starbase to uh, the options here in the trees are just very few. You, know, you need to tell which one of them the, the type, the type of the, um, of the gene tree, and here are two, two choices. <laughs>